Welcome to Wednesday webinars with the Utah Center for Legal Inclusion. We welcome all of you today and look forward to hearing from our panelists and um, are grateful to those who are listening to the recordings after the fact as well. Um, this month, we've been focusing on law and politics and have heard from several incredible presenters, including um, Professor Dane Thorley, who's a professor at BYU Law School, who discussed his research on judicial campaigns and <clears throat> in particular, judicial campaign finance. Um, last week, we had the chance to hear from Marina Lowe, who's a legislative, uh, who is legislative and policy counsel for the ACLU of Utah. And she talked about her role in proposing and advocating for legislation that covers a wide variety of issues. And I really enjoyed the conversation with her. So if you missed either of those episodes or any others from the past weeks, um, each of our Wednesday webinar episodes is recorded and available to watch on our website. Um, we hope that with each of these, you can see different attorneys and different perspectives on the many paths that a law degree can um, open up and present for people. Um, and as a bit of a preview for the coming weeks, our November theme is focused on the judiciary. So we'll be welcoming a group of appellate court judges to talk with us next week. And then in the coming weeks after that, we'll have a tribute event honoring um, the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And then we will hear from some of our trial court judges in Utah. Um, but today, as we wrap up our law and politics theme, we have three attorneys with us who all play a pivotal role in creating law in Utah. Um, we're excited to welcome Representative Stephanie Pitcher, who currently represents District 40 in the Utah State House of Representatives. And Representative Pitcher also works as a deputy district attorney. Um, we'd also like to welcome Eric Weeks and Christine Gilbert, who are both attorneys at the Utah Office of Legislative Research and General Counsel, which I'll let them explain um, in their introductions. And Eric serves as deputy general counsel in that office. So as we normally do, I'm going to turn the time over to the panelists to give a bit more introduction of themselves, including um, how they came to be lawyers, why they chose law school, and um, if they've had other jobs, what those other jobs have been and how they came to their current position. So um, we'll start off with Representative Pitcher and then maybe go to Eric and then Christine from there. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here and to speak with this awesome group. Um, so I graduated law school, gosh, I guess it's been five years now, so in 2015. And I, um, as you stated, I, I work now as both a deputy uh, district attorney for the Davis County Attorney's Office. I prosecute mostly felony offenses and um, ran my first campaign for election in 2018. And so I'm just wrapping up my first term in the, in the Utah legislature in the House of Representatives. And um, it's been really cool to kind of serve in this dual role because a lot of my policy focus is on criminal justice reform. Um, and so it's it's been helpful to me to kind of bring my day-to-day -day experience as a prosecutor to the legislature and look at kind of policy issues that deal in that realm. I went to law school. It's funny that you had Marina Lowe on last week because I actually went to law school wanting Marina Lowe's job. Um, I kind of already had some experience in social justice work and I was really interested in the intersection of social justice, law and policy. Um, but Marina has her job and so I, I decided that, you know, I think one other way that I can really affect change is, is to run for office and to bring my perspective and to work on, on laws in that way. And so um, that's kind of why I went. I went through kind of some different decisions in law school. I thought, um, you know, if it wasn't work with the ACLU, maybe I wanted to do immigration law. And then I ultimately ended up with criminal law just because I felt like a traditional office job wasn't really right for me. I like the day-to-day -day kind of bustle being in court. I like that every case is different and I like that it feels like genuinely good work. Um, and so that's how I ended up in my current role. But my initial reasons for going to law school sort of changed, but I knew overall I wanted something that would offer a lot of creativity and that would be meaningful. That's great, thank you so much. Eric? Um, I'm Eric Weeks. I serve as the Deputy General Counsel for the state legislature. Um, our office has an awkward name because it's the merger of two offices about 20 years ago, but it's the Office of Legislative Research. We have analysts who, um, who, who research policy for us and help us kind of formulate those ideas in the bills, but we also have lawyers, hence the General Counsel part, 
um, where we're basically kind of the law firm for the legislature. Um, we're, a, we're a group that um, I, I didn't really know about before I came here. Um, we kind of stay under the radar, but um, essentially we provide all the services for the legislative branch, including obviously writing laws, but um, we do the personnel matters for the legislature. We do the contracting. Um, we're basically in-house counsel for the branch as well. And we do litigation. We don't do tons of it, but we do a fair amount of appellate work. And we had two cases before the state Supreme Court in this last year, which was busier than normal, but we do litigation as well. Um, I um, graduated law school far, long, far longer ago than I tend to want to dwell on as I look back. I spent about nine years in um, private practice doing um, a lot of commercial and um, real estate and family work. Um, and I ended up here, I, I never ever in a million years thought I'd be working for government, but I happened to know the previous general counsel from a, 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 a nonprofit board that we were on together. And that ended up with me um, making a kind of a mid-career decision at that point to come over here um, and was really pleased to see one that the office existed and that it was a, a whole bunch of um, pretty smart people that didn't have really big egos that were doing really interesting work. And so that's kind of what landed me where I'm at. That's great. Go ahead, Christine. Okay. Well, as uh, Melinda said, my name is Christine Gilbert. I am uh, an associate general counsel in the Office of Legislative Research and General Counsel. Um, I, uh, well, I guess I can start with why I went to law school. So, I mean, in some ways it was uh, a happy accident that I ended up in law school and, and liked it. I came from a family with two parents who didn't go to college. And so, you know, they did the best they could to direct me from there, but frankly, didn't have a lot of experience with higher education. I did, however, have an extended family member who was a lawyer and I just, I don't know, he seemed happy and like he felt like he had meaning in his job and he seemed to be paying all his bills and that seemed like a good thing to me. Um, and so I kind of set my sights on law school at a really early age. I mean, I remember thinking I wanted to go to law school in, in fourth grade, which is, I mean, there's no way I really knew that that's what I wanted, but thankfully I'm really happy that, that I landed here. Um, and so I did, I finished my undergraduate. I went directly to law school. Um, I graduated in 2011, which for those of you listening that maybe aren't aware of the financial circumstances and economic circumstances of 2011, it was not good. And so there were frankly very few jobs available at that time. And I, in going to law school really wanted a government job. Like I wanted to be in service somehow. And I saw that um, I saw government as a good path for that. Um, but who was hiring at the time I graduated were law firms doing litigation, doing bankruptcy, fighting with people over mortgages that had gone wrong. And so that's what I did when I graduated. Um, I was like loosely familiar with this office from some internships I had done during, uh, during undergrad. And so I saw a posting, I wasn't even really looking for a job at the time, but I, I just, I saw it as a great opportunity. It was uh, kind of a merger of government service, of politics, which I was interested in, um, but in a nonpartisan capacity, which uh, also kind of fit my personality and I don't know, interests, I guess. Uh, thankfully, I have really enjoyed it. And I've been here, I'm trying to think it's probably been about eight years now. Okay, thank you. That's really great to hear about the different paths to your different jobs. But um, maybe for those who don't know about the office in which you both work, Eric and Christine, can you just tell us a little bit about what the day to day is like in your office? You want to fill that, Christine? Sure. I mean, I feel like probably everyone in our office has a slightly different answer to this question. Um, I know mine and Eric's days, I think probably look pretty different, but I would say that my main role in the office day to day is probably, and this varies, it's probably bill drafting though. I mean, that's really like, that's really what we do. I mean, we work with legislators to understand their policy goals and advise them on the best way to achieve their policy goals, the legal implications of their, of uh, 
I don't know, the policy that they're choosing to achieve their goals and uh, ultimately reducing that to writing. And I spend a lot of time in front of my computer writing and rewriting sections of code that um, eventually the legislature will vote on. And to give some background on that, and we have, we have 23 attorneys in our office. Um, there's the general counsel and then there's me as deputy. And then we have um, one attorney who primarily special, specializes in helping us with research requests. And then the remaining 20 attorneys um, each have a section of the code they're responsible for. And so you may, you may have things dealing with business and workforce services, um, and you write all the bills in that area. So we, ha we have to be nonpartisan. Um, you'll, if you're in the abortion area, you'll be writing an abortion bill for a conservative member of the legislature and writing a bill that probably does the exact opposite for a more progressive member of the legislature. And um, we, we have to hire people who um, can have the legislature's, legislators' confidence in each situation. And so that is one really unique aspect to our job. Um, Representative Pitcher gets to play a different role than we do that, that can be more interesting than, than ours sometimes. Although we, we also find ourselves in all kinds of really interesting situations where we know about both of those bills, but we can't share the existence of them with the sponsors, but yet we still have to write them in ways that they may not conflict with each other and, and come up with bright ideas to help those two different legislators achieve their goals. And so that can be the really the fun part of the job. Um, and, and you do kind of jump right in and you get to deal with all the lobbyists and people in that area. Um, my job as deputy tends to be a little more, I joke that I'm the fireman in the office, whatever crisis happens to be going on at the moment, I, I tend to kind of jump in and, and rally forces amongst our attorneys to try to get those solved or, or fixed. And so it, it can be, it can be exciting and it can be pretty varied. Great. I, I feel like it makes sense to me now, but when, before I went to law school, I didn't realize that there was this whole team of attorneys behind the scenes writing the bills that actually become the law. I had this rather naive notion that legislators are the ones that are actually writing the bills. Do you find that's a common misconception, misconception or do you um, find that people don't really know about your your office and your job and what you do? I, I think most people don't. Um, and that's by design. I mean, um, the, the, the elected representatives of the people are the ones who ought to be out front pushing the ideas and arguing them. And our, our goal is really to be behind the scenes to help them work through that um, to give them, and one of the things I love doing is giving them pros and cons, like, okay, your opposition may argue this, do you wanna counter that? Do you wanna think about that? Do you just wanna um, you know, not worry about it? Um, and, and Utah's, which is, Christine, I'd be curious, when we talk to other attorneys from other states, I, I think Utah's in a pretty good position in that some states will just accept bills from the outside that lobbyists or other groups put together Utah has been pretty good at least requiring them to go through a nonpartisan rewrite and relook before they get released. And we have 104 legislators. I mean, legislators who are attorneys like Representative Pitcher, you know, may come in with pretty well-formed ideas and suggestions of language and we work with and build on that. Um, other legislators only wanna deal in concepts and we just have to come up with it on paper. So it, it varies pretty considerably between the legislators. Thank you, that's good to know. And that maybe is a good segue to the question that I had for Representative Pitcher, first question, um, is what do you see as your role and in, in relation to the office where Eric and Christine work and um, how do you collaborate with the attorneys that, in that office and has it changed over the last couple of years since you first started? Yeah, um, it's changed a lot, I think, from my first year to my second year. And even now, feeling still pretty new, I still feel like I'm kind of learning my boundaries, like what can they do to help me? Where do I need to go someplace else? Um, but I think my first year I came in, I mean, one of the challenges of my first year was that I didn't get elected until November, but all of my other legislative colleagues could open bill files back in May. And so by the time I had actually taken office and had the capacity to open a bill file, I was several numbers down in the queue, um, which just meant essentially that my bill 
kind of fell in terms of priority, in terms of like a drafting priority. And so my first year, I remember, and I had a little experience doing this before I ran for office, but I, I had drafted legislation for before and worked with attorneys in the Office of Legis Legislative Research and General Counsel um, when I was working with my elected representative at the time. And so my first year, I think probably the majority of my bill files, I had kind of taken a stab at myself and then handed them to the drafting attorney. And I don't know if it was helpful or not, but for me, it was at least helpful to myself to kind of flesh out a concept. And it seemed to maybe speed the process up a little bit where I was so behind as a new as a newbie. This last year, um, I still like to be involved in the drafting process in some way, probably to the chagrin of my assigned drafting attorney, but um, I have learned to just kind of let it go and let them do the drafting work. They obviously do a much better job than I ever could and they have guidelines that they follow and things like that. So it's certainly changed and I anticipate that my own approach will continue to evolve as I'm there longer. That's really interesting. I um, feel like as an attorney, it could be both a pro and a con, right? To come into that position. But um, maybe your your answer raised a couple of additional questions in my mind, including, and maybe um, Eric and Christine can speak to this. How do you go about deciding which bills get drafted first and who gets assigned those bills? Is it just based on the where in the code it will fall or how how's that process work? Yeah, I mean, you got that pretty much exactly right. So as Eric mentioned, we're all, all of the attorneys are assigned a subject area. And so for example, my subject area is tax. And so anytime a legislator requests a bill in that's gonna affect the sections of code that are tax, um, it gets assigned to me or one of my colleagues who works in the tax area. Um, and that's the same for all the subject areas. If it affects this particular section, it's gonna be assigned to the attorney responsible for that section. So we really have the whole code divided among, among the attorneys. Um, in terms of drafting order, it's basically a first, first to request, first out. So we do it in order in which we receive the request for the most part. There's a couple exceptions to that, which is um, all legislators are allowed to uh, designate a certain number of bills that are really important to them. We call them priority bills and those jump ahead in line. So they're more likely to get drafted uh, before the others, assuming we have the information needed to draft it. And so, um, so there's that. And there's also legislation that um, committees can request and that those, those bill requests also receive uh, special priority. So we'll do those first. Um, so it's like, it's pretty regimented from our perspective. Like we know the order that we're supposed to be working on and there's not not really a lot of fudging from, from our perspective. That's that's good to know from a, a person in the public standpoint, right? That there's a process and that it it's not about someone having some unique position that gets, you know, priority or anything like that. So um, another thing that um, um, Representative Pitcher mentioned that, um, well, or maybe it's just raised by the fact that Representative Pitcher is an attorney and she she comes to it with that background. Um, maybe you guys can each speak to what skills are necessary for your job that um, a law degree actually helped you to have. And it, I mean, of course, for the um, attorneys in the Office of Legislative Research and General Counsel, you have to be an attorney to fill that position, but um, maybe you can talk about why that is and what law school taught you that helps in drafting legislation. And then we can go to Representative Pitcher and she can talk about how her legal skills help her in her role. Eric, do you want to start us off? Yep, I can jump on that. So when we, we look for a real specific subset um, with attorneys and, and um, I don't think the attorney we look for has changed, but the dynamic with legislators has changed a lot in the 15 years I've been with the office. Um, when I first started, um, we were much more of a part-time legislator and um, I don't think politics had evolved to the point in Utah that they had in other places. And, and we would get new legislators who would come in and they were thrilled that they had policy people who could do research for them and attorneys who would draft their bill for them and, and go through these ideas. And, and as time's gone on, 
um, we found there's a decent amount of legislators that we have to win over. Um, they don't they don't want lawyers going all over their drafts, and and, and that's different from what Representative Pitcher was talking about. We it's actually great when we have other attorneys that we can talk shop talk shop with, and 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 you know note that we use this word and they prefer this word and have a, have a lawyerly conversation about the difference in the two. That's fine. Um, but we've also, but I've also found that just with the internet and with a lot of um, Utah kind of growing up politically, we've got a lot more purely kind of political, politically motivated people, which is great. Um, most legislators become legislators because they're really interested in particular changes. They want to change the world. Um, we have to find a really unique mix of attorney who understands that and gets that and is excited by that because that's the part of the job you love. But we also have to get attorneys who are really good at looking at both sides and 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 don't get and and have the ability because I I do get personally invested, but we can't get <laughs> workplace invested in the bills we're drafting. We have to be able to. Um, sit down with someone we completely agree with on a bill we're super excited about and come up with really great ideas to get that done and secretly root, maybe we're rooting for it. And we also get bills, and this happens to every attorney, um, that we think are horrible ideas, that we also have to come up with really great ideas and find ways to get it down best on paper and to be the most effective. And so we have to look for legislators, I'm sorry, for, for attorneys who um, get job satisfaction out of doing that. And that's a, that's a specific subset of attorneys. Um, and um, we also have to get attorneys that don't want to be out in front and take credit for bills or, or feel slighted when a legislator says, I like my word better than yours, so we're going to use the legislator's word. Um, we, we have to have attorneys who um, don't, don't have big chips on their shoulders, too. And so the ability to be able to do that, you know, if, if, a, if an attorney comes into our office and says, I'll work on this in this subject area, but I'm not going to work in this subject area, they're probably not going to get hired at our office. You have to be pretty flexible and, and pretty willing to, to be open to different viewpoints. Christine, you probably got a million things to add to that as well. I really don't. I think that's all exactly right. And I mean, I think um, those are the personality traits that, that I think make you great for our office. I also think that the skills you learn in law school are essential. I mean, you have to be a great writer. You have to be able to think about words like they're pieces of a puzzle and that there's um, ways that you can use words to express really complicated ideas in a simple way. And I just think um, at least as, as I experienced law school, that's what good writing is and, and that's what it taught me. And there's no way I could do my job without a law degree, even setting aside the legal analysis portion of it. I feel it made me such a better critical thinker, such a better writer. And, and I feel like that's, that's really what the job requires to do, to do it well. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna drill down into a couple of things you guys raised in a minute, but uh, Representative Pitcher, what do you think that your law degree adds to your work as a, as a legislator? Yeah, um, so as has been mentioned, you don't have to have a law degree to run for office and to, to be a member of the legislature. But I honestly think that the biggest thing my law degree has done for me is given me the confidence to operate as a legislator and to feel confident in the work that I'm doing. And I think also having had um, two to three years working um, in my field, so in my day job, I mean, we're constantly opening up at the code book and saying, well, what does the statute say? You have a specific set of facts and we have to determine, well, does this case fall within the elements of the statute or not? And so having learned how to do that first in law school and then having actually applied that practice at my day job, I think coming into the legislature, if I hadn't had that, had that experience previously, I would, I honestly, I think I would just feel a lot more insecure about being there or my capacity to be successful, my capacity to do good work. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that's the biggest thing that it's done, of course, like practically speaking, understanding how to read statute and understanding how that works and practice is obviously helpful as well. Thank you. Um, before we go back to some of the things that Eric and Christine raised, I had a question that I often get in presentations and I feel like it's maybe even more relevant um, since you mentioned that you also have a day job. I think in Utah, we're 
I don't know if this is true, but we're rare in that our legislators keep full-time jobs elsewhere too, right? They're not just legislators. And so how, um, how have you found that you can best keep the balance between your day-to-day -day work responsibilities and that of a legislator? I feel really lucky that I have a very accommodating boss. And he was, I think, the first person I spoke with about me running apart from like my immediate family. Um, so I remember sitting down with him and saying, hey, I think I'm thinking of this, but you know, I love my job. I wouldn't leave my job to go up to the legislature. So the only way it will work for me is if this office is able to accommodate. Um, and they've been extremely accommodating. So I've been really lucky in that regard. That's really great. And I think that is actually one of the real strengths of our legislature is that people come with with that background of having their work experience. Um, but going back to some of the things that Eric and Christine mentioned, um, you talked and we've talked a little bit about the fact that the attorneys in your office are assigned to specific portions of the code. How are those assignments made? Eric, you tell me how the mystery goes. I don't, I don't know. He's the boss. Maybe we're getting into um, <laughs> territory where we shouldn't go. So if that's the case, you no. can let no. <laughs> It's the whim of, of my boss, the general counsel and me, but <laughs> no, I, I, some of it's, some of it's what we need at the time. I mean, Christine didn't start out in tax and we frankly needed someone really smart and capable for a tax emergency when we, and Christine moved over for us. And so um, sometimes it's just necessity. Um, uh, over time, people who work at the office find areas interesting and, and put their you know, name in the hat to kind of be considered when someone moves on or retires to go into that area. I think most people, most of the attorneys in our office after, over a course of four or five years work in more than one area. Um, and some people who have found a spot and love it and are great at it have been there for 15 years. And so um, it, it kind of, it, it's, a, it's a mix of of, of necessity and interest and capability. Okay, sounds like a lot of other law offices, right? Yeah. So that's, that's helpful to know. Christine, did you have anything you wanted? Well, I guess you turned it over to Eric, but any insight? Yeah, no, no, I think, I mean, I would just say that I feel like, um, yeah, I mean, Eric described it exactly what my experience has been. And, and I do think that our own, our personal preferences do get, like great consideration in making the assignments. And so, yeah, cool. I think for the most part, people end up somewhere they're happy. Great. So maybe we can start with Representative Pitcher on this one, but um, we like to raise this question with all of our panelists. What are some of the major pros and cons of your particular legal job or job as a legislator as well? Pros and cons, ooh. Um... I mean, the biggest pro, I think, is the ability to do meaningful work. I think it is really, really cool that I have such a direct um, opportunity to contribute and to do something that can potentially improve the lives of lots of people. Um, and it's also been really fascinating to me to get to work with so many of my colleagues. And kind of like you said earlier, they all come from different backgrounds, different parts of the state, different education um, you know, different family. I think in a lot of ways, um, we could use more diversity at the legislature, but there is a good deal of diversity in terms of um, like work background and um, of course the, the demographics. And so it's been really fascinating for me to get to learn from my colleagues and understand their perspective based on the constituency that they represent. Um, I think in terms of cons, it can be really stressful sometimes, depending on what you do. One of the interesting things about my job is I can really control my workflow. It's completely up to me how many bills I file or I don't file. I have some colleagues that I think kind of, um, I don't know if coasting is the right term, but they're just kind of comfortable voting um, and you know voting on behalf of their constituency, but they don't take up a, a large policy agenda. Um, I think that uh, in doing that, just depending on the issues or the, the potential opposition, sometimes it can be really stressful. That's interesting to all the different approaches. So yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Christine, how, what, do you, what do you feel are the pros and cons of your position? Interesting, I'm trying to, I'm like going through them in my mind and trying to, trying to think of what the top ones are. Um, 
I think my primary, my biggest pro, which I, I'm sort of surprised that it just keeps coming to the top of my mind. It's not that dissimilar from represented pitchers, which is strange because we have such different roles is that I think I might value most about my job, the individual, like the relationships that I have with individual legislators that um, being involved in politics from a nonpartisan perspective and having the opportunity to get to know people whose um, political ideologies may be so different than mine um, and getting to know them on a personal level and see maybe where they're coming from and what their intentions are is fascinating and and for the most part really rewarding and so and that's that's one of my favorite things about the job um i also love drafting like i i love writing bills if i didn't like that i think this job would be a really bad fit for me and so i i really enjoy that process um my final pro i think is just getting to be um involved in major policy discussions that i get to at least be a fly in the wall a lot of times, if not have a hand in some really major things that are happening in Utah politics. And that's just really exciting. And, and I really love that. The cons, oh, one more pro from a lawyer's perspective is that we have a pretty manageable schedule. I mean, I came from a law firm where I was working an unbelievable number of hours and it was really awful. And uh, I mean, there were great things about it, but the hours were really tough. And so we have hard times and long hours sometimes, but for the most part, um, I feel like I'm able to give my family the attention that I want and keep a really meaningful job. And so that's that's another thing I really appreciate about, about my position. Um, cons, <laughs> um, I don't know. I feel like the reality is that sometimes as nonpartisan staff and being someone who's who's in the background, which I, I don't mind, I actually really prefer it. Uh, you know, sometimes we're scapegoats too, and sometimes that's our proper role, but it can be, it can be challenging sometimes to um, hear that a bill is failing or bad because of something that I wrote, and that may or may not be true, but even just hearing that can be hard sometimes. Um, so I don't know, I think, I think that's, that's the major one is, um, sometimes feeling like we're getting blamed for things uh, without really being able to defend ourselves. And then, um, I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Just getting caught up in the politics every once in a while can be can be challenging. Thank you. Eric, what, what would you add to that? Oh, I'll start with cons because all of a sudden war stories are arriving in my head. <laughs> um, but I, we're in a unique position. Um, I, I've, I've gotten in the paper because I've had to write legal opinions that were contrary to some of my clients' public statements. Um, and it's really hard to walk that line. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's really, it, it's a double-edged sword for everything. Every con I've got has a pro that I just really love. And just the diversity of being able to work both sides of an issue and, and, and go to one meeting where you've got proponents of the bill, um, working with you to enhance the bill and going to another meeting where you've got opponents of the bill working to pick apart what you've done. And that can be really fascinating and you see how politics work in ways no one really else does. And that, that's really fascinating. Cons, um, you're not gonna get rich doing this job. Um, it, it pays well for a government position, for a government attorney position, which I, I think it should because we're really the last lawyer that touches most of the state policy. Um, but um, we're in constant, I, the people who work here could leave, leave tomorrow and move down off Capitol Hill and double or triple their salary. And that's, or, or even move is, you know, we've lost a lot of um, attorneys to high positions in, in you know, the executive branch. And so that's, that's one of the struggles we have as kind of leaders and, and legislators to trying to keep the talent that we have. Um, but um, it's, it's an area if you want to do constitutional law, there's no, no better place. We deal with it all the time and it can be really fun and fascinating. Um, and um, have, have being able to just, uh, it was fascinating to me my first month, you know, I worked on a couple bills. You know, what you're working on is always the front page of the paper. And it's interesting, it was fascinating to me to see a bill that I'd worked on and I was in the back rooms and I worked with, and I had conversations with the legislator and I knew the real story. 
and to read the story that the that showed up in the paper the next day about what really what happened. You know, I, um, not that the media was necessarily wrong, but you've got this poor reporter who's just trying to find out the truth from all of these different sources. Um, and th but the real story is something that you saw and the public doesn't necessarily get to see. That can be wonderful and horrible <laughs> depending on the situation. But um, that's, that's kind of one of the fun things about the job is you get to really see how laws get made. That's great. Um, I feel like that's true in a lot of life, right? That the pros and the cons are go hand in hand and you have to, to take them both together. But um, all three of you raised this issue that's been really on my mind and I know on a lot of people's minds lately. And that is um, in our day-to-day -day lives and in, especially in politics, we are running up against um, disagreements and um, difficulty in being able to talk to people about, about things that we disagree about. Um, it sounds like all three of you are having to deal with that on a daily basis and to be able to maintain strong relationships even when you disagree or when you have very um, opposite views to the people that you work with. So um, I think for the students and the educators on our that are part of our audience here. Um, that's also, I know in talking to teachers, that's one thing that they're working on with their students is how to have better discussions around difficult issues. So um, maybe if you have any, like your top pointers as to how you navigate those, those situations when you are have, facing a disagreement with someone and how to do it in, in the best way. And maybe, maybe at times you haven't and you learn from that, but, um, if you have any pointers for all of us, including myself, that would be really great. Um, and I'll, I don't wanna call on anyone without giving you a minute to think about it, but um, maybe we can start with, um, Eric, you're still unmuted. So maybe that, I don't know, you're not, you're just green highlighted on my screen. Quick enough. It's you. <laughs> um, Christine, maybe you can think of pointers cause you're more practical than me on that stuff. but. I, just an example, and since this is a diversity thing, I mean, um, I, I'm gay and out at work, and um, that was an issue when I first decided to be public about that, and it's not so much now, but um, I, I ended up ha having to be the drafter on the um, LGBT housing and employment bill several years ago, mm -hmm. and I think that's kind of a good example of some of the pros and cons. Um, it was my area. I kind of did this civil rights kind of stuff. And so it naturally fell to me. And, um, you know, you're, you're in a, every, every word in that bill goes through my typewriter. Um, and so every suggestion that we had, I had to kind of parse and, and put into words and, and rephrase. And, and um, I, I think you see pretty uncivil conversations whenever you're drafting bills, you'll, you'll have, You'll have ideas that might be kind of personally offensive to you, or you feel that um, make the state a worse place instead of a better place. Um, and um, the role of our attorneys are is to facilitate that dialogue. Um, we don't take sides; we stay out of that. Um, but you know, if we're drafting a, one of the things we always try to do is. Um, talk about the other side. If, 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 if a legislator has a bill that's going to be pretty controversial, um, I kind of feel like it's a dereliction of my legal duty not to talk to them about, you know, the, the opposition may say this. Do you want to address it? Do you want to sit down with me and brainstorm responses to that that you're okay with? Um, and so in some ways, we facilitate them getting their ideas out. And, you know, and sometimes other legislators who will see the legislation we've just come up with will come to us and say, I want to change this. I want to substitute bill or I want to amend these lines. And so then we work to do the other side. And, you know, that that works both ways for us sometimes as well. And so I guess as far as bridging the divide, I don't think we see that. It's not our role to jump into politics as attorneys in this office, but it is our role to understand them and um, to prepare our clients for um, the inevitable discussions or fights that may, may happen as a result of that. Um, and I'm personally 
okay whether they want to address it in the bill and maybe you know move towards the center or whether they want to um, stick with their position even though it's controversial and at least understand the issue and be able to respond to it and have discussion we always love it when there's more discussion rather than just trying to hide things or cram them through and if that's you. maybe a little to the side of what your thing is but it's it's no. something we try not to we've got enough we're trying to do we try to really stay out of picking sides which no, can be it, hard yeah it, it definitely can be and i think it's nice to know though that there are people who are their main role is to facilitate conversations right and that's something that we need in a lot of different areas so so that's and, helpful to know. and it's probably important to point out that those conversations happen right um, Every, every legislator that has a controversial bill, uh, some, some of them just barge in and, and aren't very thoughtful about it. But frankly, the vast majority of legislators have had a lot of conversations with, with attorneys and colleagues um, before they throw that idea out. Thank you for sharing. I think that's helpful for all of us to know. And maybe is a good segue to maybe Representative Pitcher, can you give us your perspective as to how you deal with, with the, I mean, kind of inherent conflict in your role? Yeah. Um, I came into it thinking that that would be a pretty big challenge for me, especially coming in as a Democrat in a very, you know, uber majority Republican legislature. But I have found two things. One is I approach my work as it's very issues based for me. So, um, you know, I'll approach my colleagues on a specific issue and we can have a conversation on, on this issue. And I don't care so much kind of where they fall politically otherwise. And I hope that they wouldn't care so much coming from me either, as long as I can bring credibility to the issue that I'm presenting to them. Um, I've also found that your reputation at the legislature is huge. I, I remember my first year starting out and kind of already understanding the importance of this. I probably took it overboard. Like I remember my first year, I was texting my colleagues just to give them a heads up that I wouldn't be able to vote on a specific bill just because I felt like being upfront was really important. And I do, I took it overboard in the sense that I was, I remember texting like representative Lizenby who's a very conservative member of the legislature to let her know that I wouldn't be able to vote on her abortion bill. Like obviously she knows that. Um, but what I have found is that being upfront and honest is always, always best. And so I, I try to do my very best in terms of when I'm, uh, advocating for a bill that I'm running. I'll be very upfront about what the opposition is going to say. Um, I'll try and also include in that conversation ways that I'm working to address it or ways in which I feel like even though these people oppose the specific issue of the bill, here's why I think it's still important. So I think kind of giving all sides to the conversation and just being upfront and honest is the most important thing that I can do, at least in my own personal experience, because I feel like I have credibility with my colleagues, even if they don't agree with me, I want them to be able to trust me. Thank you. That's, that's really nice to hear from, from a, you know, constituents point of view. So, um, Christine, do you have anything to add on this particular topic? No, I mean, I, I think Eric and, and Representative Pitcher have covered it okay. really well. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll let you take our, I'm gonna raise my last question and then we'll open it up to the attendees to ask questions. So um, for those of you that are listening in, feel free to um, enter your, you can type your questions into the Q&A and I will get those or, or chat to me um, directly and I will um, field those for our panelists. But um, I'd love to hear from each of you and I'm not sure how much um, Eric and Christine, you can talk about the individual pieces of legislation, but I'd love to hear like a proud moment that you've had um, in terms of like a, a bill that you were really proud of or a piece of legis or an experience that you've had that made you feel really proud of the work that you did. That is an interesting question because it makes me really think about what gives me satisfaction in my job. You know, I, I think that my day-to-day -day work is really satisfying, but think pointing out particular moments, like what about that? I mean, I think for me, I can think of a couple instances. Um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I'll just point out what I, I worked on um, a fairly big reform of Elk state alcohol laws in, I think it was 2017-ish. And 
I never feel like proud of the policy in the bills that I draft, to be honest, because it's not my policy. None of it is my policy. I mean, maybe I've advised or, or helped give them counterpoints or make them think about things they wouldn't have thought about, but I don't make those decisions. So I want to be clear that when I'm proud of, you know, I don't know, kind of tying something that I'm proud of to a piece of legislation, it's, it's not the policy that's in it, but like, I felt like at the end of that, it had really been a marathon and um, it had, it had been a lot. And at the end of it, um, the legislator I was working with, who was um, primarily now speaker Brad Wilson, um, he was just really happy and like genuinely thankful for the work that I had done on it. And um, same with the stakeholders. And it was just like, it was a really satisfying experience because it was hard and long and a lot of negotiations. And I felt like I had contributed something to a product that was kind of hard fought, not from a political perspective, but just from getting um, something together that accurately reflected the interests of everyone involved. It was, it was a really satisfying experience. Shoot, I muted myself instead of unmuting myself. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. Um, how about you, Eric? Mine's gonna be similar to Christine. It's hard to point out specific things. Um, but you know, sometimes I'll, I, I, before I came here, I worked in real estate for a firm that did a lot of construction at ski resorts and I'm a skier and that was like a dream job for me. I'd have clients that would fly me out to some mountain and talk about where the building was gonna go and we'd work on all that and I'd fly back on their private plane. And then I got here where, you know, when I came out to the legislature, I didn't even have a parking spot when I moved over here. It was a real kind of rude awakening. Um, but the, 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 the real nice moments come, frankly, during the middle of session. Um, we're, our, our lives from mid-December through mid-March are go beyond any excruciating nasty trial period I had. They're just, it's just really, really busy for that period of time. Um, and you get, um, and you're constantly in kind of heated um, or high stakes conversations about lots of different bills that are floating around. There are people arguing or wanting to change things. And, and the biggest joy I have is in those exhausted moments or similar to what Christine said is we're kind of facilitators. We don't, we don't, we, we are blissfully unaware of the hard work that Representative Pitcher has to go through by talking to all our colleagues and collecting all the votes. But we facilitate what the words on the paper say and we facilitate agreements. So a legislator will come to us and say, this policy isn't gonna float. And the real rewarding moments are when we can sit down with that legislator and say, okay, well, what, what do we think can? How, how can we come up with a way to make um, the, two, the, the two complaints you've gotten actually workable? And so being able to facilitate that and knowing that in small ways, we're working on things that affect the whole state rather than just some rich developer I was working for and make sure he gets his hotel at the ski resort. And that's, that's really where my job satisfaction comes from. Thank you. Representative Pitcher, do you have a bill or a moment where you felt like you were really proud of the work that you've done? Yeah. Um, Earlier this year, I passed a bill that addresses pretrial release practices and cash bail reform. I think the night that that finally passed was a really proud moment for me. Um, I haven't fully allowed myself to rest on that yet. I think there will probably be continued conversations about this issue, probably for another year, maybe two more years. So I haven't fully kind of let that one sink in yet. But um, my first year, I passed another bill that prohibits or yeah, bans the shackling of pregnant inmates during labor, delivery, and postpartum recovery. Um, disappointingly enough, that was actually a relatively common practice in our hospitals and jails um, with inmates. And so that bill passed a year ago. And um, I think it was a really important issue. I'm proud of that one. Thank you. Okay, I had a question come into the chat to me. Um, for Representative Pitcher, and maybe we can actually adapt it to the others too. But um, again, um, if others have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. But um, for Representative Pitcher, um, what do you do or how do you navigate a situation where a constituent asks you to propose legislation that you might disagree with personally? It's a really great question. Um, so if I disagree, well, a couple of scenarios can come up. I guess if I disagree, it doesn't really matter. But I mean, sometimes my 
my policy agenda or my capacity for any more legislation is already full by the time I hear from someone. Um, that's kind of a really easy excuse if I don't like the bill that they're proposing to me. But the bottom line is if I don't agree with the legislation that they're proposing, I think my, the first step for me is to look and say, maybe this is an issue for me personally, but what would the majority of my district think? Um, and I can be okay with that. I voted before on an issue that I didn't personally love, but I got enough emails from members in my, or uh, residents in my district, that I felt comfortable that that was the right thing to do. So that would kind of be the first step for me is seeing, well, how does the actual district feel about this? Um, and then I think beyond that, I can refer them to another colleague who may be, uh, a, another legislative colleague who may be able to help them. Or more often than not, I think what I end up doing is I just kind of explain why I don't think that this is, you know, the right bill or kind of explain my perspective. Um, maybe because I, I don't know that I would want to see that necessarily <laughs> introduced. So um, it, it really just depends on what exactly that issue is. That's interesting. Thank you. I'm going to adapt that question just slightly for, and I'll address it to Eric. Um, have you, over the course of your time in the office, I mean, you touched on this briefly before, but when you are asked or tasked with writing legislation that you personally disagree with, how do you navigate that process? Um, I think all of our attorneys deal with this. Um, I, we, we draft what we're asked to draft. I mean, that's, and, and, and Representative Pitcher talked about trust. Trust is the currency of the legislature. It is personal relationships. That's how things get done for better, or for worse. And if a legislator senses that we're against their idea and they lose trust in our, in the, you know, that we're gonna draft the bill they want, then we have a real career problem. And so um, yeah, just with the housing employment one, and this is probably not the best solution, but I, I found myself where we had a version of the bill that we were dealing with that I'd been in a meeting with the sponsor until literally 2 a.m. And we'd walked out of a very heated moment where I thought we had made a change in the bill that was going to be disastrous for me personally, as far as the right to marry and adopt and all that kind of stuff. And fortunately that sponsor, as we were walking out, pulled me aside from away from everybody else and said, what do you think about this personally? And I said, I don't have opinions about this personally. I'm not supposed to share that with you. And I probably wouldn't advise this to my legislators, but or to my attorneys, but he pressed me and it was 2 a.m. and I'd had a bad day and I broke down and said, here's the things that I think are wrong with this bill, um, speaking, purely as a person. And um, we sat and we, we worked through some of those. Um, I don't think our attorneys usually do that, but I think <laughs> all of us have had really hard bills where um, you know, our, our job is to inform them. And so if we see something that's against, you know, that, that's against court precedent or something, we'll usually inform them of the court precedent and say, you know, if, if you pass this, there's an existing court case that's almost on point and, and it's probably gonna get overturned. Um, and our advice to them is that, you know, you can either adapt for that or the legislature has a role in passing stuff that's currently unconstitutional. Otherwise, courts don't have their, those cases in front of them. And so we will not, not infrequently draft something that we know and the sponsor knows is unconstitutional or, or has other legal problems. Um, but our goal is to inform them so they're not surprised by that. And then we let the other systems take care of it. So sorry, I need to apologize to Christine for giving a really bad example on the record, but that's not normally how we do things. Yeah, I think I, I, we like to hear the real, real story. So thank you. Um, we're just about out of time, but um, I want to give you each maybe just 20 seconds and you can give us any closing words and keep in mind our audience is often students thinking about law school and whether they're, whether it's the right path for them. So um, if you have any words of wisdom um, you know, in your last 20 seconds, we'll start with, um, we'll start with, with Eric and then we'll go to Christine and then Representative Pitcher and wrap up. My, my default is to always try to talk people out of going to law school, <laughs> but, but, um, I, I think if, if, if lawyers make a difference in society, and if that's really why you want to go to law school and you, either you want to help people or work within the system or, or help, help decision makers make make decisions on legal issues, then, then you're in the right place. 
Um, but know, knowing that that's what you want to do, I think, is an important piece of the system. There, there are much more efficient ways to make, there are much more efficient careers to make money than the law is in the last decade or two. That's great. Christine? Yeah, I mean, I think I would, I would say two things, and it's advice that I could, I would have liked to in better internalize as a young person, which is just, um, I don't know, be thoughtful about where you want to end up. And uh, I know there's, it's impossible to know exactly how that's going to be, but, but give it real thought and explore things and talk to people and, and be open. And I think that'll be a huge benefit. My other piece of advice is just always do your best that no matter what job you're doing, give it a thousand percent because people will notice you if you're making copies really well, they just will. And just always do your best. Great advice. Um, Representative Pitcher. Yeah, sorry. Remind me one more time of the question. What's advice for going Just to law your, school? Your 20 second, what should people take away if they're thinking about going to law school? Oh, got it. Yeah, I mean, I think that once you get once you get to law school, you're going to probably be steered in the direction of a firm track, corporate track. And so I think these types of events are really important in terms of exposure to understand that there are a lot of different things you can do with a law degree. I think more than anything, a law degree offers so much flexibility. Um, and so don't, don't feel, don't feed into that. I don't think that um, law school often paints a comprehensive picture of what career options are available to you. And um, I'll also put in a little plug for the legislature, regardless of whether you go to school or not, we need more young people at the legislature. We need more, um, people of diverse backgrounds. I think whenever I talk to young people about running for office, they some of them will say, well, you know, maybe in 10 or 20 years, but really young people have a perspective that no one else can bring to the legislature. They know about, um, they know more about the for affordable housing crisis than, than many of my colleagues. They know more about um, access to quality and affordable childcare. They know more about the challenges making ends meet under minimum wage. I mean, there's so many different things and perspectives that young people bring that we need desperately up at the legislature in terms of making, making laws that affect everyone. So if you're thinking of running for office, um, what's the minimum age, 25? <laughs> it's a great time to do it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, and thank, thank all of our panelists today. Um, we went a few minutes over and I apologize, but um, thank you all for your time in presenting here. And I'm really grateful for the insights and for the encouragement for our students here. Um, and for all of you on the call, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week. Take care, everyone. Thank you.